All right. So background design and painting 101. Let's do this. So what we're going to cover, we're first going to cover what is background art. So in terms of 2D animation, 3D animation, a little bit on games, and then I've got a page of some other options for doing background art. We're going to talk about how the pipeline tends to function. So stuff that I see a lot of even college graduates not being totally clear on. Um, we're going to talk about why environments can be scary and some tips that I have for overcoming that fear, a little bit of general advice, and then we'll get to the demo. So first, who am I? If anyone doesn't know me, I am at Devin L. Kurtz on Instagram or Twitter. I'm the lead background painter on the Netflix show Disenchantment, which I work on over at Rough Draft Studios. I've been there for three years. Um, and yeah, you can go check out my Twitter or Instagram if you want to after the fact. So what is background art or BG art? Background or environment art is just art with a heavy focus on the environment the, you know, rather than the characters or the props or objects. It's art with a focus on the environment. And if you see the word BG art, the phrase BG art, that is going to be in reference to background art. That's what that means. It's kind of an industry shortening for it just because it's easier to say. So background art, it can be a huge variety of things. It can be simple or complex, stylized or realistic. So here I've got two examples of backgrounds. We've got a background from Steven Universe on the left, which is much more stylized, graphic, simple. And then background art from Tarzan on the right, super detailed, so much going on. We've got animated flames. We've got a 3D animated ocean. These are both equally background art. They're just two totally different ways of approaching it. So in terms of 2D animation, what is background art? Background art is everything that isn't a character or a prop. So in this shot from Steven Universe here, we've got a character peeling potatoes, that is not part of the background, and then we've got props. The bucket that he's peeling into is a prop, the potato peeler is a prop, the potato is a prop, the bags of potatoes are a prop. The rest of it is the background. So you guys can see that there's actually a difference in the line quality here, which sometimes happens uh, in shows, where the props and the character, they have you know much harder lines because they're being animated. Props and characters are being animated, whereas the backgrounds are stationary, so they can have the more painted lines. That's not always the case. Some shows have the same line quality between the backgrounds uh, and the characters and the props, but I would say it's actually pretty common for the backgrounds uh, to have a little bit of a different look than the characters and the props. So what is background art in terms of 3D animation? So on the left here, we've got some VizDev art from Monsters University by Daisuke Satsumi. And then on the right, we've got the final screen cap. So what we're usually looking at here is going to be concept designs, moving into concept paintings, moving into 3D models, moving into, you know, the lighting, the texturing, the rendering, etc. Um, and you can see the building here that is done, that's been created in this VizDev piece. It might have been designed elsewhere, but you can see it in this VizDev piece. Um, you can see it finalized here in the final screen cap. So in terms of video games, background art is usually called environment art. Um, and uh, it can be anything from painted backgrounds behind a side scroller. So like that's kind of similar to what we're looking at in this Super Mario screenshot here, uh, all the way to, you know, concept art for a fully rendered 3D modeled game like this Final Fantasy remake screenshot on the, on the, the right here. So what other background jobs are there? I'm not going to go too much into detail here just because there is so much, uh, so many other options, but here's a, Little example of some other things you could do, stuff like set design, theme park design, you know, book illustration, magic cards. There's lots of other applications for background art outside of animation and games. So let's talk about the 2D animation pipeline. The, in the 2D animation pipeline, background design and layout and background painting, they are two separate job titles. So on the left here, we've got a layout by background designer Faith Schaefer, who will be reviewing portfolios with me later. And then on the right, uh, we've got a, the fi a final painted background layout also by Faith Schaefer. The color key was by Rachel Verity and the paint is by me. So you can see that the design stage, which is one, uh, one type of job doing background design and layout, these are black and white and sometimes grayscale designs. And then painting is a totally 
separate job most of the time in 2D animation, at least in union shows. Here in Los Angeles, we have an animation union and they are two different job titles, doing background design and background painting. So sometimes background design and layout are also separate tasks. Not always, usually they both fall under the title background designer. So designs are not gonna be shown on screen. They're usually just used to figure out what a location looks like and might be used as a key for an overseas studio. So if uh, something is being animated in say Korea, sometimes there will be design keys that are created, which then the overseas studio would create final layouts from. Some studios work that way. Other studios do all their own layouts. Layouts are what is shown on screen. They're exactly what you see when you watch the final animation or the drawings that are painted, finished, and then animated on top of. So what does a design or layout look like? They might be created with line, blocks of gray tones, or a combination of the two. So on the left here, we have a line-based background layout from Steven Universe by Steven Sugar. You can click this link if you go to the link in the description and go to this slideshow. Um, you can see more work by Steven Sugar. And then on the right, we have a layout from Ben 10 by Charles Hilton. You can see that that's done pretty much entirely in gray tones rather than, uh, rather than in line. And some shows will actually do a combination of the two. So it could be anything in this spectrum. So what might a background designer be responsible for? Um, usually they'll be responsible for at least three of these things, maybe all five of them. So reading the script and doing preliminary concept work. That means, you know, having an ability to work from a description. They might just have words on a script and then maybe a folder of inspiration from an art director or a director or a writer. Uh, style matching the design and line art style of the production. So that means being able to style match things like shape language and also the actual physical line quality of how things are put down on the, on, you know, the paper, quote unquote, the file. Taking an assigned scene number from the storyboard and turning that storyboard into a finished layout is going to be a huge part of the job most of the time in TV animation if you're a designer. And you might do multiple rounds of roughs before finalizing a design. You might have to do some back and forth with an art director, with a director, with a showrunner, etc. And you might be given revisions for a scene later on in the schedule. What skills should a background designer have? So for me, I think the most important thing is the understanding of the space of the background as a stage. You know, these characters and the props, they are using the space as a stage. They are the actors. They need the space to be doing their acting. You know, what we're creating is a stage for them. And we do that through using perspective, through understanding perspective. We use it through understanding structure and form for creating structures, forms that feel solid, that feel like a character can walk across, that feels like it exists in a real space. We do it through shape language. You know, so in the top example here, which is a screen cap from Steven Universe, we've got this big round mountain in the background and then this very low square building. And then we've got these swooping triangular lines from the phone line. So we've got a combination of rounded shapes, square shapes, triangular shapes. You know, being a designer is using all of those different shapes, creating all that different shape language and using it to express emotion and storytelling, which is the next skill that a background designer needs to have. So I love this screen cap from Tarzan on the bottom because there's so much storytelling that happens. You could show this to someone who knows nothing about the movie and they could get some understanding of what's going on. You know, we've got these explorer hats in, on the wall. You got kind of an idea of what the characters might be like and it's been ransacked. Everything is broken. There's claw marks on the piece of wood in the front. There is so much visual environmental storytelling happening in this one shot. Something else that a background designer should be able to do is visualize the final scene. You know, we, we want to be able to imagine what it's going to look like painted, even when we're just doing it in line. Um, there's a question of, is there a typical turnaround time for a background? That's going to vary wildly based on the production. You know, it's going to totally depend on the level of detail, etc. So another skill that a background designer should have is creating a foreground, middle ground, and background. So in the bottom reference here, the screen cap from Tarzan, we've got that piece of wood with the claw marks in it. That is the foreground, that's in front. And then the rest of the interior, that is the midground. 
And then behind that, we've got the sky, those little bits of leaves hanging down, and that bar from the uh, the walkway outside, that is the background. So we're creating depth by doing that. You know, there isn't always a foreground, midground background, but a designer should have the ability to create those three spaces in the stage. So other things an aspiring background designer should be aware of, we're going to touch on overlays. I'm just putting that word in your head. We're going to get back to that. We're going to touch on multi-planning and parallax. That's going to come in the future too. What we're talking about here is translating storyboards. So I've got this awesome example from Steve Lotwait's Twitter, which is linked in this slideshow. You should definitely check it out if you want to be a BG designer. Amazing, amazing resource. He does so much information on Twitter. So you can see there's this storyboard panel pulled from Big City Greens in the kind of the middle of the page here. Um, and then you can see how that's translated into the final design and it really is an art, it's a dance. You know, there's things that have been added, there's things that have been changed, taken away. You know, taking that initial storyboard panel and turning it into a final design, it's, it's, it's something that's learned, you know what I mean? It, it, takes, it takes time to develop this skill, but it's something that you, as an aspiring designer, that you should have in your mind an understanding of. You should also have an understanding of props. Some shows will have background designers doing props too, others won't, but regardless, you should kind of have an understanding of how props are going to interact with the space. And then also you should have an understanding of types of shots. So these are filmmaking terms, you know, doing a pan, doing a close-up shot, an establishing shot. Familiarizing yourself with filmmaking terms is going to help really help you in interacting with your storyboard artists who are setting these shots up with your art directors and directors who ha will have an understanding of these kind of filmmaking terms i super recommend having some you know general base knowledge of filmmaking terms and um and understanding them so that you can communicate more clearly with the people that you're working with all right so overlays what is an overlay an overlay is a background element that's separate from the rest of the background so you can see in this screenshot from Amphibia here, that tree is covering her foot. It is in front of her. That is an overlay. It's a painted element, but it is in front of the characters. The characters are between it and the background. Um, and overlays may, uh, may multiplane, which another word for that is parallax. And that means that it is moving at a different speed across the screen from the rest of the background. And that's done to create depth. Um, back in the day, back when animation was done traditionally, overlays would actually be painted on a physical animation cell sheet that would be overlaid on top of the characters. So if that helps you to think of it that way, it is physically laying on top of, it is laying over the characters or whatever is happening underneath it. So pan shots, this is something else that I think maybe isn't uh, you know necessarily thought about for people outside the industry. But a pan shot is where the camera is moving through the background. So on the left here, I've got another storyboard panel and then finished design pulled from Steve Lotwait's Twitter, which you should, again, definitely check out. These are from Big City Greens. You can see how the camera's start position is different from the camera's end position, and the camera is actually physically moving through the background. In this example on the right, you can see that the tree is actually being distorted by... Uh, it's got camera distortion happening. Like, if this was an illustration, you maybe would not illustrate it this way. It looks a little weird, but it's done because as the camera moves up through this space, we want to create the, the feeling of camera distortion of the camera actually physically turning up. So the background, this pan shot has to be painted that way. This is something that is not necessarily uh, thought about, um, you know, outside of a studio setting, but super important to be aware of. So moving on from background designers to background painters, what might a background painter be responsible for? A painter might be responsible for taking finished black and white or grayscale designs to a full painted finish. That's going to be most of the job. Um, it might involve doing multiple rounds of color thumbnails or creating, you know, generating color ideas based on descriptions or maybe reference packs from art directors, directors, or showrunners. And it usually involves integrating feedback before moving on to the final painting. Um, it might include style matching the existing painting style of a production or style matching, you know, a color key, a first background that's been created in a scene. So both on the macro scale of style matching the whole show to the micro scale of style matching a single location. And, you know, that means like how it's painted, the brush strokes, you know, is it graphic? Is it painterly? Uh, what kind of textures are being used, employed? What kind of color schemes are being used? Is it muted? Is it vibrant? All of those things are taken into account. 
It might involve integrating production assets. So sometimes production assets will be painted ahead of time. These are usually things like trees or clouds, and they might be integrated into the backgrounds to create kind of a unified feeling. Um, and you might be, be given revisions later on in the schedule. So revisions are always sometimes a part of the job. And that sometimes means going back into other people's backgrounds. So my number one tip is to keep your files organized and that way everyone on the show won't hate each other by the end of the production. <laughs> so what skills should a background painter have? Storytelling through color. I know I've talked about storytelling already and I'm going to keep talking about storytelling because at the end of the day, we are storytellers. You know, everyone who's working in animation, working in games, we are telling a story the, the, you know, what background painters are using to tell the story, it's color, it's lighting. You know, what is the color making you feel? What does the lighting make you feel? Um, it's also using control of value, um, both for storytelling. You know, is it low key? Is it dark? Does it make us feel gloomy? Is it bright? Does it make us feel airy? Um, also using value to create silhouettes. So, you know, these buildings silhouette against what behind, what's behind them. Those clouds silhouette light against a dark sky. The buildings silhouette dark against a light backdrop. We definitely want to understand form and light. So designers need to understand form while they're constructing their forms. Painters need to understand form as they're lighting and shading their forms. You know, you can see here in this example, there's this light that's being cast on this building. And you can see where the building is turning over. And, uh, you know, it's turning, the, the plane is changing, so there's a shadow on the side. You know, a, a painter needs to be able to control those elements and create that feeling of three-dimensionality. Atmospheric perspective is another skill that a painter should have. So you can see that that hill in the background, even though it might be a, uh, a green, you know, lush hill, because it is this time of day, you know, it's kind of dusky, muted, um, and it's pushed back in space through atmosphere, through dust, particle, dust particles in the air, we get this light, creamy color. And then the most distant building is also going lighter and more muted so that it pushes back in space. That's atmospheric perspective. And then, of course, a painter should be able to add texture and detail. So you've got to be able to style match the textures of the show. You want to be able to indicate what material something is through, uh, through the textures that you add, through the painting details that you add. What else should a background painter be aware of? So you should be aware of effects like smoke, fog, rays of light, etc. Usually that means working in conjunction with effects artists. Um, it means envisioning scenes holistically with effects that will be added later. So usually there are effects artists who are adding these elements in, but you want to be able to look at the storyboard and envision how that is going to impact your painted background. And sometimes uh, it involves painting effects yourself. Usually that will mean extending them beyond the bounds of the canvas so that they can be, you know, animated or panned across the scene. All right, this slide is super important. You know, the background is a stage. I know I've talked about this before, but this is super important. Characters need to be able to move through the space and act, you know, in, in our animated shows, or in our animated movies, these characters are the actors. They need space to do their acting. Um, it needs to feel like a physical space that they can walk through. You know, light and shadow should reinforce the character action. So on the on the right here, Scar is in the shadows. Uh, you know, this is that that shadow is reinforcing him as a villain. It's reinforcing what he's doing in the moment. And then it's also really important that the background painters, you know, understand and keep in mind that the background usually isn't the focal point. It shouldn't be overtaking the characters. And if you are going from illustration toward, uh, toward being a background painter for an animated production, it's a change because, you know, we're not inserting that focal point into the piece anymore. We have to, you know, overlay that storyboard and envision that focal point being there and make sure that what we're doing supports that character action. Moving from 2D to 3D. Okay. In 3D, visual development is the catch-all term usually used to describe the concept design artwork for a CGI animated movie. And we'll talk about how VizDev is also a stage and, you know, 2D shows and whatnot, but we're just kind of generalizing here. Every production is going to use different, uh, different words for this stuff, um, but just generalizing here, VizDev is kind of what this is called, this type of art. And VizDev artists are usually separated out into environments and characters. You know, you've got a whole team. People will specialize uh, in, in this field. You know, we're all working together. We've all got our strengths. 
So if you guys want to go into this, uh, into the slides presentation, you guys can take a longer look at this. But really what I want you to walk away from this slide with is that whether it's for 2D or 3D or whatever, visual development is development artwork. So we're moving from kind of like the final painted backgrounds that you see on screen in a 2D show to development artwork, which is going to change and evolve and go through lots of iterations before landing on a final choice. So working with 3D artists is going to be a really important uh, skill to have working in on a 3D animated project, whether it's a show or a movie, because everything eventually has to be modeled. It needs to be functional. And a location often will be passed back and forth between modelers and VizDev artists. And, you know, every production is going to have a little bit of a different pipeline for this. But, you know, you might design a location, they might do a rough modeling pass in 3D and pass it back to you to do a rough color and lighting pass. You know, there's sometimes a dance that happens between 2D and 3D artists working on 3D animated projects. In the 3D animation pipeline, everything needs to be designed, not just the glamorous stuff. So I really love this stuff too, but you know, it's not necessarily what you think about when you think of VizDev artwork. On the left, we've got building designs here for Into the Spider-Verse uh, by Zach Retz who will be on the panel later, you know, every single building needs to be designed. And of course, some things are kind of auto generated using technology these days. But you know, everything does need to come from a base space of being designed. You know, on the right here, we've got this uh, topograph topographical, uh, you know, cutaway drawing by Corey Loftus for Frozen. And it's showing the actual like 3D forms of the snow so that the, the modelers are able to see, you know, what is the actual volume of this space. All right, what skills should a VizDev artist have? The most important thing, in my opinion, for VizDev artists to be able to do is iterate on an idea. It means going through multiple iterations, not being too precious. You know, your ideas are going to need to change and grow. They might be thrown away. You know, they might be brought back. Another artist might have them. They might be handed off to someone else. You know, working in a VizDev space means being okay with change constantly. You know, it's throwing out lots of ideas, being able to create lots of different options for something. VizDev artists should also be able to visualize from a description. Sometimes you're just going to be working off a description from an art director or a director. Um, you know, sometimes they'll give you a Pinterest folder, but it means being able to take kind of words, you know, these, these concepts that are just in our head and then come up with ways to show it on the page. So of course, same as the subjects we've talked about before, VizDev artists should be able to use shape, light, color, you know, convey mood, use perspective, structure, the fundamentals to create storytelling, because ultimately what we're doing is storytelling. And then I really think this is important. VizDev artists should have their own unique sense of design. And, you know, this is because like VizDev artists really are hired also for what they bring to the table. You know, a team will have so many different people with different experiences and each person's unique experiences in life and their unique vision will will help create you know, what the amazing end result is. All right, taking a drink of water. So I'm not going to go super hard into games right now, because although I have done game art myself and work on game projects, uh, you know, I've done maybe 3% of what's out there. I'm actually going to be organizing a whole game art stream, getting game art artists on. So if you guys want to look at this slide, you can. I think the most important thing talking about uh, games is that in some games, everything has to be able to be viewed from 360 degrees. And of course, gameplay is important when we're talking about games. So here's another, uh, here's another shot. This was actually uh, sent to me on Twitter at one point by artist Amber Blade Jones, who is in the chat. And, uh, you know, they were actually talking about this earlier. Um, but uh, this is asset art on um, both animated shows, you know, and and, uh, and games with 2D painted uh, environments are going to be, um, are going to sometimes integrate assets. And you can actually create asset sheets for yourself and use them in your own projects to get a kind of unified feel. And yes, this is live, which is being asked in the chat. So what should a portfolio look like? All right, rather than showing you guys what a portfolio should look like, I'm going to teach you guys how to find out what a portfolio should look like because there's just so many different options. There's so many different ways that a portfolio could look. It depends entirely on what kind of, you know, production you want to work on, what kind of projects you're interested in. So the way that you're going to figure out what your portfolio should look like is first you're going to decide what job title you're investigating. So, you know, background design, background paint, viz dev. 
we're going to go to IMDb and we're going to choose uh, a project that we really like, something that we would want to work on, the kind of project that we would want to work on. Here's the Steven Universe IMDb page, and then you're going to go to the crew section. So there's a little screenshot there of how to, uh, how to get there. You're going to find the job title you're investigating. So here I have arrows pointing to background painters. And you're going to Google these artists. You're going to create a spreadsheet of the public portfolios you find. Not everyone will have a public portfolio because sometimes people have too much stuff that's NDA. But usually you can, uh, you can find at least half of these people on any given production will have a public portfolio. You're going to create a big spreadsheet of it, at least 10 to 20 portfolios. And you are going to use this. You're going to use this to figure out what your portfolio should look like. And here's the kind of things that you're going to think about. First, concise and strong is better than vast and weak. And you're going to figure out what are the common traits among the portfolios you've gathered. Because remember, these are portfolios from projects that you would want to work on. So what are the common traits among the portfolios of people who were hired to work on that project? If you put your work right up next to it, does it hold up? What range of subjects is covered in these portfolios? What kind of things are people drawing and painting to get hired on these projects that you want to get hired on? And then, of course, how are they presented? You know, what do they look like? Um, and this is kind of an overlooked aspect, but we really want to create the easiest viewing experience possible for, uh, you know, art directors or whoever is looking at your portfolio. And a quick BG portfolio tip is to cover close up and far away, organic and man-made, dramatic perspective and flat perspective, and simple and complex. If you can cover those eight things, you're usually good. All right, why are environments daunting? You know, the main reason for this, I think, is because it's everything else in the whole world, you know, besides what we usually, what people generally start with, which is characters. And there's so much information to learn. It's everything. It can be really overwhelming. It was for me. I remember being there. Perspective can be daunting to learn. And artists that are used to organic shapes, you know, like people, like characters, might have a different, uh, you know, might have a difficulty with then moving into things like rigid structures, like buildings. And it can just feel like too much sometimes. So how do we overcome this overwhelm? My best advice is to narrow your focus. So choose a single type of locations, bedrooms, kitchens, gardens, whatever. You're going to choose one focus. Choose a narrow color range. So for example, on the left here, this is all blues. This is pretty much monochrome. You could limit it to time of day, limit the color, you know, limit your decisions. What we're trying to do is cut down on the amount of decisions that we need to make and that will help eliminate overwhelm. And then choose a simple value structure. So for example, here, there's lighter in the back and darker in the front, super basic. You can also do the opposite of that. We're starting simple. Limit the decisions you need to make and then slowly branch out as you build confidence. What are the bare minimum components necessary for success? What choices can you eliminate yourself for yourself? So if you're struggling with drawing, start with fun 2D shapes. If you're struggling perspective, explore using a 3D software and tracing to learn. We do want to learn perspective because it's going to be really hard to add all the elements you need in a scene if you have to block in absolutely everything in 3D. But it's a tool that's available, and I love uh, being able to, you know, ha have people learn from it, to be able to trace it and so that it can make sense, so they can go, oh my god, all these lines are converging to here, I get this now. So if you're struggling with color, then forget color. Start with just value for now. What you're going to do is eliminate your, bro your roadblocks. Remember that there are no rules. We've made all those up, and the only real failure is failing to begin. Once you've broken it down, we're going to build it back up slowly. We want to build confidence. You've broken it down to the bare minimum decisions necessary, then build it back up until you have the confidence, until you feel like I am making good work. And you can slowly, bit by bit, add variation and challenge back in. When it feels like too much, we can choose to make it less. So to sum it up, we are storytellers. This is probably the number one thing that I want everyone to walk away with. Every decision that we make is for the purpose of story. We have to think about everything in relation to story. The background is a stage. We are creating a stage for the characters. We want to limit the scope to overcome overwhelm at start. And then I want everyone to learn to find the portfolio info they need because that is one of the best skills that I ever developed. 
here are some resources. You guys can screenshot this or go to the description and access this slideshow. All right, we're moving on to the demo. Let's do this, guys. I'm just gonna keep charging ahead because uh, we've only got 15 minutes before the first break. So here is a design of mine. We're gonna, I'm gonna take you all the way through from design to finish on this thing. So the first thing I'm always thinking about is what is gonna be my foreground, midground, background? Are those all gonna be present? How am I dividing them out? How am I creating depth? You know, I wanna create a space, a stage and depth. And then I'm figuring, is this gonna be warm or cool? And I'm thinking, what is my emotion? You know, what is the storytelling that needs to happen? You know, what is, what's the storytelling that's happening in the design and how can I reinforce that with the painting? You know, so that means figuring out the color scheme and the value structure. So here we've got my foreground, middle ground, background lay-in. You know, we've got this foreground, which is uh, these two poles, these two pillars, and then a little bit of stuff hanging off, right? We've got this mid-ground space, which is where the character is going to be. This is the main stage area. And then even in this, even, even in this piece, we've got a background area, which is the space going up toward the steps. That's going to fade back. We want that to recede in space. So you can see even in just this lay-in, you can already see, you know, the depth. You can already start to get a feel for this space as a stage. So getting into the flat color. First, we just want to figure out the general vibe. You know, what do we want to feel? What do we want to feel here? I always block in the biggest colors first. I want to first just in, you know, in large swaths, figure out what, when I squint, is this going to, is this piece going to look like? We're going to work muted first and then add contrast later. I like to work from muted toward contrast because I find it much easier to add contrast than to take contrast away. I've always felt that way. That is a personal choice, but I've always felt that starting muted and then building up contrast with lighting and shadow has been easiest for me. And then of course we want it to carry the emotion. I want this scene to feel warm. I want this scene to feel cozy. And so the colors that I'm adding, I want to reinforce that. So here's my second stage of flat color. Here's where I'm adding, starting to add in the variation. So we worked from similar toward variation. You know, every single background is a dance between what's similar and what's different. We want it to be similar enough to be cohesive, but have enough variation so that it's interesting. And it's always a dance between those things. So we want variation within objects too. Like I tried to get different greens in, in these plants. I didn't want them all to be the same green. And I tried to get difference within the skulls. They're not all the same, you know, bone color. And then of course, how does it feel? Are we getting that cozy feeling that we're going for here? All right, flat color three. What I want to talk about here is rest versus activity and sameness versus variation, which we just touched on, which is that every single piece is a dance between what's different, what these little points of interest and contrast are versus the rest area, what's the same, what feels unified. So I'm always trying to create a balance between those two aspects. We don't want too much variation that it feels chaotic and thus we're going for that, but we don't want too much sameness that it feels boring. So here's my first shadow stage. I'm already thinking about what the focal point is going to be. And I've got an arrow pointing to where that character is going to go. You know, if I had a storyboard for this, I would be overlaying the storyboard to figure out where that character is going to be in this scene so that I can design the lighting and value structure around it. I use multiply layers for my shadows and I use, I do big shadows first. So I'm always working in big shadows down to small shadows. And I'm always thinking about the overall value structure and the foreground, midground, background. Here is the first light pass. This is where it really starts coming together for me. I'm really at this stage thinking about emotion and storytelling and directing the eye. I want that eye to start up here where the there's light coming in from upstairs to follow down to where the character is going to be sitting. You know, we want this swooping motion that gently leads us down into this warm, cozy nest that the character is going to be sitting in at the base here. And the program that this was done in is Photoshop. I work almost entirely in Photoshop. There are lots of other great programs too, though. So at this second lighting stage, um, I am focusing on adding in that saturation where necessary. Remember that I like to work from muted toward saturated, so I'm building up saturation. And then again, the vibe, what is the vibe? What is the mood? What is the feeling? 
How does this feel? Do I feel like it's warm? Do I feel like it's cozy? So here I've got my character in for the first character check. We're looking at the composition. Does this composition work with where the character has landed? Does the focal point read? And is the storytelling working? These are all the things that are in my head as we get that uh, this first uh, you know character read in here. And if this is for a show, we're just gonna have a storyboard overlay. And uh, here we've got um, our occlusion shadows have been added. So occlusion shadows are when uh, there is no ability for light to permeate where two surfaces are touching. So if two objects are touching each other, um, then uh, you're going to get a, a little occlusion shadow where those two objects meet. This is a really important stage for making things feel tactile for making them feel like they uh, you know, are actually touching one another, creating those little occlusion shadows. And then also we're adding our cast shadows. So when there's a light source and there's something blocking that light source from hitting a surface, we're gonna get a cast shadow on that surface. And then here we are also thinking about distance from the light source. So where there's lots of light, it's gonna be you know, brighter and more contrasty. And then as we move away from those light sources, it's gonna get more muted, more, you know, less contrast, closer together in value. Um, yeah, uh, uh, this is a personal piece of mine, just to be clear, this is not from a show, you know, NDA reasons, this is a personal piece of mine. <laughs> um, some shows will have people doing color keys specifically, others will not. Some shows will have background painters just doing everything, doing, uh, you know, color keys to finish, other shows have color key artists, um, it definitely depends on the production. So uh, the last thing I'm thinking about here is controlling contrast. You know, contrast is the tool to get us to look where we want, we, we want viewers to look. So we want to limit contrast in the areas that are less important and increase contrast in the areas where it's more important. All right, next we're doing rendering. This is going to depend so much on the production, on what you're working on. You know, this is probably much more detailed than your average, you know, TV animation background, but all of these same skills will just be used to a lesser degree if we're, you know, working on a more simple show. So my recommendation with rendering is to work smart. That means using textured brushes that mimic the textures that you're trying to paint and figuring out creative solutions to use your digital tools, you know, stamps, you know, textures that you scan, whatever, whatever helps you achieve those results in the most streamlined way. Um, and then always keeping the overall value structure in mind. One thing that's really common that I see is people getting to the rendering stage and then losing the read that they had because they start rendering in areas where there shouldn't be contrast and it's adding in contrast. So we always want to keep the thumbnail in mind. Use reference for your textures. You want to have stuff pulled up. You want to be doing little studies if you have to, to figure out how to get something to read correctly. Simplify whenever you can. So we always want to be thinking, how can we create this texture in the most simple way possible? And then you can, it's always easier to add more detail. It is harder to create an aesthetic, you know, an aesthetically pleasing, simple texture. So we're always thinking simple first, and then we can add more if necessary. We want to control the detail. We want to keep uh, we want to keep the detail in the areas of focus, and then we want to limit the detail in the areas that are not the focus. And again, the overall read is most important. You know, can people grasp this instantly? Do they understand what's happening? Is it clear if we squint? Especially when we're working on something for a TV show or a movie, things need to read immediately. You know, it might only be on screen for one to three seconds. People need to grasp the space and where the character is. You know, they need to understand what's happening immediately. So the overall read is most important. So now we're getting to finish. So the ways that I, you know, people always ask like, how do I know when something is finished? Well, first of all, if you're working on a production, it's gonna be finished when it matches the established finished look for a shot. Um, the things that I like to think of when I'm finishing something are first edges. Are my edges clean? You know, are they controlled? Does the focal point read? You know, if, you, if you've got that storyboard in there, does where the character action going to happen, uh, does that make sense? Is it reading correctly? You know, do the textures read as the texture they're supposed to be? Does the wood look like wood? Does, does the brick look like brick to the extent that it should for whatever production you're on? And then, of course, is the story and emotion reading? You know, 
is uh, is the story coming through? Does this feel warm, cozy, inviting? Does it feel the way that we want it to? And that's it. So, all right, guys, we've got uh, we've got five minutes to sh to spare. So I am going to try to answer some of these questions. Um, I, uh, I have five minutes until the first break. Thank you guys for sitting through this 40 minute, uh, this 40 minute, uh, BGR 101 lecture. All right, let's answer a couple of these questions. So how do you show background painting skills without having to design the background if you aren't start strong at drawing, but are at painting? So I know that I personally, I'm going to be releasing four background designs that will be free for anybody to paint, to use in portfolios, to use for practice, to use for fun. And I'm not the only one who's done this. Other people have in the past. Um, and definitely, you know, ask around on Twitter. These exist. It is totally possible to get designs that you can paint for your portfolio. And at the very least, I will be creating some. And, you know, if those go over well and people find them helpful, maybe I'll do even more just so that people, you know, painters have things that they can paint for their portfolio so they don't need to be thinking about design. Um, as, a, as a background painter for feature, what instructions or files are you given and what is left for you to decide? So, you know, for anything, what the instructions are and what's up to you is going to vary so much from scene to scene, from shot to shot, from production to production. It's going to, it's going to completely depend on what you're working on. It could be anything from here is exactly what I want this to look like. Here are all the references for it. Please just match this from another angle to, I have no idea what I want this to look like. Can you do three options and show them to me? You know, it could be anything in between those. How do you get started drawing a background? I feel like there's a lot of different elements to add to one piece and no clear place to start. I think I answered this one earlier. That's okay though. Like what I, what I said earlier and what I mean now is big shapes to small is always the way for me to go. So big movements, you know, big motions, big swooping shapes first, and then, uh, and then slowly moving from big into medium and then small. That is always the way that I have found uh, most effective. Um, for the designs you're releasing, can we use them to create 3D environments as well for portfolios? Yes, they will be they will be free open to use. The only thing that I will ask is that I'm shattered out somewhere or that my signature uh, slash like handles left on it. That will be it. They will be free to use for whatever you want. You know, even if you want to pitch something, they're just going to be open for whatever you want. Um, question as a viz dev artist, are you doing both BD BG design and paint? Usually viz dev artists are going to be responsible for both, but again, not always. Um, it, it really depends on the production in those cases. When I've been doing, vi when I've done viz dev in the past, I have been doing both, but again, that is not always the case. So it, it, uh, it definitely depends on the project. How important is having perfect perspective? How do you balance stylization and correct gridding? So a little secret about me is that eyeball, I eyeball so much stuff. Like I, I really fake it so often. Um, if you try to draw a, a grid over my pieces, especially when you start uh, getting down into the nitty gritty, um, I love that slightly wonky look. And the show that I work on really, really also loves that slightly wonky look, which is Disenchantment. So, you know, I've kind of gotten a, you know, a love for that, um, for that feeling. But, uh, you know, some... Some projects are going to demand pretty exact perspective. Others are going to really want you to, to wing it and to create some fun shapes. Um, what are the general sizes you work on? Um, I like to work pretty big. I actually have switched to, to working at 600 DPI just because of the, um, the show that I work on works at 600 DPI, usually at least 11 by 17 inches at 600 DPI, um, if that's helpful. How long did it take? Uh, to feel confident in background art. All right, this is the last one I'm going to answer before the break. Um, I It took me, I would say, about two years for me to feel actually confident to stop feeling afraid every time I was starting something. But I got to tell you, a lot of it was, a, was an attitude thing. I think that could have happened sooner if I had narrowed my focus and stopped putting so much pressure on myself to understand and know everything. Once I realized that I didn't need to understand and know everything, I felt so much more centered and so much better. And that really allowed me to build my confidence to focus on the things I was good at and then slowly, bit by bit, add in more.